Hope everyone had a nice lunch, and like Tyler was saying, if you start dozing off, it's understandable after having a full stomach <laughs> in the afternoon with this weather. So again, I uh, hope you had a good one, and we'll start back up where we left off here. Uh, any questions at all before we get started on any of the ones, uh, people or events that we've been talking about? None, nothing at all? Okay. All right. Um, again, we finished up with Barton Stone. Remember with Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone, Barton Stone. And again, a couple of mentioned it, like Ruby and everything about there's so much here. Don't try to memorize it all. We have the, some of the printouts. I uh, got that reference. Just kind of get a little familiar with the names and everything, and you can go from there, go back and see some of the readings, things here. So it's a good, good start for you. So again, I'm proud of you for being here and showing that interest in our history. It's our history, isn't it? History of the church in the modern times, basically. So it's good to know this. Uh, we're not alone, and our uh, fathers before us weren't alone, thanks to some of these men. So anyway, Barton Stone, a lot of people in that uh, are not, uh, that are opponents of the church will try to really throw things in like, you know, you're a Campbellite, you follow Campbell. Well, we've seen that he didn't found the church. He just discovered a lot. He studied himself out of denominationalism and that there were men before him, even like Barton Stone and uh, the Abner and Elias Smith who were reaching the same conclusion. So that just strengthens our position that in the Bible, you can understand the Bible like the Bible says. If you leave away the tradition and have that open heart of wanting to just listen to the Bible, the Word of God. I mean, there's so much wisdom in there, right? And it's God speaking us today. How does the Spirit move us today? It's through His uh, Word, right? Stronger and active than any two-edged sword, right? And that's true. It can cut to the marrow of our souls, right? If we let it. So some, some of the opponents of the church, well, so Barton Stone really didn't believe in baptism that much. Uh, but this is from Barton Stone himself. When he writes, he said, The subject of baptism now engaged the attention of the people very generally, and some, with myself, began to conclude that it was ordained for the remission of sins. Again, as we've been emphasizing, this is a radical idea. And ought to be administrated in the name of Jesus to all uh, believing uh, penitents. I remember once about this time we had a great meeting at Concord and mourners were invited uh, day to day to collect before the stand. And he goes on and then we talked about that and I mentioned as we concluded that he came to the same simple conclusion. All you have to do to become a Christian is listen to the Bible. Acts 2.38 tells us, Acts 22.16, 1 Peter tells us what we need to do to become Christians. And part of that is baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And he came to that conclusion. So he did believe in the necessity of Adam. He saw that. I mean, it's hard not to uh, when you study the Word. So we have that period of, of being coming out and establishing New Testament churches based on New Testament principles that we believe in. They, they became members of the Lord's Church by studying themselves out of denominational and obeying the Gospel and going according to the pattern of the scriptures. The pattern is so important. The New Testament talks about it. And again, opponents of the church, even those in the church, there are opponents who try to denigrate that and say there is no pattern. There is a pattern there. If you hear that, they're trying to say there's no pattern for our worship, for what we believe. That's that's a devil's lie, right? It's not true. So anyway, we have these men and between 1832 and 60, a tremendous growth uh, from 1832, 25 to 200,000 members. And remember, the country didn't have that much of a population back then. Probably by 1860, it was about 27 million, I believe, something like that. So great growth. People were hearing the word. It was received, being received gladly by many people who were uh, recognizing the truth, the simplicity of the gospel. And it is simple, isn't it? If you just let it speak for itself, it's not complex. No creeds. No organizations outside of the local congregation, just Christians coming together, worshiping the way God wants us to worship. So great growth. One of the ones that was really responsible for this was a great evangelist by the name of Walter Scott. Ever heard of the books Ivanhoe and, uh, 
and I forget what other, he was a distant rel relative of that Walter Scott that lived a hundred years before. He was born in Scotland again, like so many of these men, graduated again from the University of Edinburgh, so very educated again, immigrated to the U.S. a little later than the Campbells in 1818. He was baptized in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Before he became a close associate of Alexander Campbell, he had contact with the, uh, remember I mentioned the Scots Baptist who recognized that child baptism was wrong? And, uh, and started preaching baptism for missions. And he was kind of associated with them. And then he met Alexander Campbell. He opposed the creation of missionary societies, which we're going to see is a big problem for the church a little bit later. Organizations greater than the church. He always opposes that. First preacher to extend an invitation after the sermon, too. He recognized the need for that. And he met with great results because of that. So when Scott concluded 35 years of uh, ministry, he traveled nearly 90,000 miles. Imagine that on horse. Again, I, the, 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 these guys were tough. These people were tough back then, and I, I couldn't do that. 90,000 miles. Travel one mile on a horse if you're not used to it and see how rough it is. Preached over 9,000 sermons and had himself immersed over 1,200 converts. Uh, very eventually, I read that when he was on fire, you took notice. It was good. It moved you. It was scriptural. It had great truths in it, and it was just inspiring. Other times, if he was a little depressed or not moody and stuff, he could be kind of off. So it was kind of hit and miss. So, but when he was on fire, he was on fire. Walter Scott said... Uh, Someone said to me, he was a man uh, utterly indifferent to the material interests of the world, craving only the gifts of God to mind and heart and spirits. No man had ever risen to such heights of eloquence or uttered such burning, passionate words of appreciation as Walter Scott. In speaking before the multitudes concerning the spiritual gifts of God to men, Campbell wrote that uh, down there too, if you want, talking about how great he was, uh, I mean, how much he admired him. Walter Scott was really the one that pressed the baptism issue too. He's the one that recognized this is a key component of the New Testament call to become a Christian. Immersion for believers for remission of sins. He really recognized that early on and he really, really taught it and spread that message. So Martin Stone gave emphasis to, so that you had these three great men, Martin Stone, who, uh, who preached, you know, away from uh, further west than Alexander Campbell, and Alexander Campbell, and then Walter Scott. And one person wrote the following about the three. It said, Barton Stone gave emphasis to God's love for man and his willingness to save him on the simple terms of the gospel, the simplicity of the gospel, and how we needed to be united as people. Because being a Christian is part of being a family, right? Family of God. We're supposed to be that way. That's why it breaks my heart when people, and how often today, the lesson we can learn, do we separate, not because of a big doctrinal issue, but because of hurt feelings or something. When we're in families, our true families, when someone hurts us with stuff, do we just cut them off completely and most of the time? No, we have love for them and try to, try to help them and everything. We don't just leave. And that's what we need to do as Christians is help one another as a family of God, right? And show that love. And Barton Stone had that great love for God. God's, he understood God's love for us and how we should reflect that in our own lives. Alexander Campbell said of him, said he gave emphasis to the authority of the Bible in matters of faith. That we have to have authority. We have a pattern. We follow that. You know, that's the basis of what we believe and teach today. And... Walter Scott provided the evangel uh, evangel evangelistic zeal which assured the success of the Restoration Movement. He really, uh, he really preached the word all over and people responded to it. And it was a good gospel message. Those three men, as well as a couple others, really were responsible for the church growing as it did. We, can be very, we should be very thankful for their uh, zeal. And we can learn from that too. We should be zealous to preach the good word, to not be ashamed of it, the truth. Not be ashamed, oh, we don't use instrumental music in worship. Oh, that's so weird. 
be able to defend it. Uh, this is why. This is why it's so important. There's a pr principle behind it. You need to have that knowledge. Another colorful character during this time of growth and who was preaching, who came out of denominationalism, was Raccoon John Smith. I forget, I read how you got that name, or I forget how, but that was the nickname, Raccoon John Smith. Very famous, again, uh, um, oh. Raccoon John Smith, there's a, the uh, state marker again with a cabin that was born on Elder Raccoon John Smith, associate of Alexander Campbell, establishment of the Christian church in this area. Again, at this time, the churches were called either Churches of Christ or Christian churches. It was kind of interchangeable. So he was born in Tennessee, raised a very strict Baptist. Reminds me of some of my relatives. Uh, very strict. Uh, but he renounced Calvinism in 1822. After hearing, seeing the readings of, uh, of uh, Alexander and Thomas Campbell on the issue, he studied it out for himself. And with that open heart, he saw what the Bible taught on the issue. After contact with Alexander Campbell, he renounced that faith and he became one of the rest leading figures in Kentucky. Now, we had that period of growth, right? That period of growth. Now we have controversy come in. The church has been established for about 30 years, over 30 years. Church has grown. Guess what happens? From within our own number. Not from without. Not persecution from without. Just like in the first century. The church didn't apostatize because of the persecution of the Roman Empire. It grew from pressure from the outside. It was from within. And same thing's happening, going to happen again. A couple of things that really brought it into focus that it caused the division, even though the issues were greater than these, as some people tried to point out. But these were the two things that caused the controversy and the division. In 1849, the American Christian Missionary Society was created. Okay? What's a missionary society? Again, it's churches, and again, it sounds good and everything. The churches got together. We're growing. We need to be organized and efficient. So why don't we have... A bunch of churches will have a society, elect a president, churches will send money to this organization, will have uh, people will hire, they'll spread the gospel. All the churches need to do is send money to this organization and they'll take care of the missionary efforts. Well, wow, great, they're going to have, have missionaries out there preaching the word. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that, John? The pattern. The pattern it seems people didn't realize it. Well, no, it's a pattern because the churches are independent of one another. You know, we can we can have that. It's the churches are independent. It's free will. They don't have. They're not forced to, but they don't see that the principle there, right? And that it's not in the Bible. In the Bible, what do churches help one another? They can help uh, other uh, preachers and stuff, but it's there's no society in between there. There's no organization outside of the New Testament church. One of the big reasons, and we're going to see from 1865 to 1906, was hard times. It started in 1860, actually, because what happened in 1816, the war between the states, right? Christian against Christian. Oh, hard times, difficult times. Uh, we can, we have difficult times nowadays. Nothing compared to then. Nothing compared to then. One of the reason, and eventually, this when the split happened, was we're going to see the majority of churches decided to have these innovations, and those who stood for the truth were definitely in the minority. One of the reasons why I think the missionary society was successful. There's a couple of reasons. One of them was. When they formed the society, they said, who would be a great guy to represent that and be the president of this society? Who would do that? Was that, uh, Joyce? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sister, sound alike. <laughs> Alexander Campbell. Guy that... <laughs> What's that? The Campbell suit. No, I don't think they were related. 
but anyway, they had asked Alexander Campbell to be head of it. Guess what he did? Accepted. He accepted. Good lesson for us, right? This was a great man. You know, I've been talking great, and he did great things every day. He accepted this. Most of the people, they're not aware of things, the principles you know, and what they think. Oh, if Alexander Campbell endorses, it's got to be all right. Stevens, our preacher, if he says it's all right to have a missionary society, well, look at all the good he's done. Let's preach some good lessons. Same thing happened with Alexander Campbell. You know the ironic thing too, this was one of the two main things to split the church was missionary side. Guess what the other one was? Instrumental. Instrumental music. Guess what Alexander Campbell was opposed to the old day he died? Instrumental music. Never accepted it. He knew what it was. It was not scriptural. It was not in the Bible. Worship. Christians didn't have it in the first century and we shouldn't have it today. But... The missionaries, he accepted that. Even though earlier he had, in some of his articles in the Christian Baptist Millennial Harbinger, I believe early on, he opposed it. You get the feeling that, guess how many, how hard would it be for 20, 30 years to be admired and, and have people fawning over you? You're so great, you're so great. And then they ask you to be president. That sounds like good. It's pretty good. Be good on the ego. Be hard to resist temptation, wouldn't it? He didn't. Walter Scott recognized this was, and he was a dear friend of Alexander Campbell, always was even after this, but he, read, he said, who made Brother Campbell an organizer over us? You know, he should be of all people aware of this. But Alexander Campbell always believed missionary societies were scriptural as he called it, even though people pointed out it's not in what you taught yourself. It's outside the Bible. It's not of the Bible. It's a start of what? Denominationalism. What we came out of. But because of his influence on that, it really uh, a lot of churches were influenced by that. Great lesson for us there, right? Tolbert Fanning. What's that? Say that again. I couldn't hear that. Disciples? They were, yeah, they, they were going to send missionaries out under that society. Not a congregation sending someone out, but they would hire missionaries from that society. So the church, the congregation really didn't have anything to do with it. Okay. So you had the president of the missionary society making the decisions, not the congregation. Don't sound too bad at first, you know. It's kind of a little thing. Well, little things tend to grow up. Exactly, exactly. And as we can see through history, it has. It has. When the church split on this issue there, the only two things different was missionary societies and instrumental music. That was the only difference. And a lot of people point that that's the only two different ones. That's not no big deal. Well, it was. Tolbert Fanning was one of these that became involved. He was one of the first ones to say, Alexander, you know, you're great and we admire what you did, but missionary societies are not correct. He was born in Tennessee, uh, one of the most influential preachers in the South prior to the war between the states, president of Franklin College. He helped start the Gospel Advocate magazine. How many have heard of the Gospel Advocate? Still there, right? Still there. I used to subscribe to it. Uh, we got to remember too, during this time and afterwards until actually until about 30, 40 years ago, magazines among the Brotherhood was an important thing for information, good and bad. There were good things about them and bad things. Good things if, if the editor was scriptural and uh, sound, you know, he had, again, influence. Good influence. Tol Tolbert Fanning with the Gospel Advocate always opposed missionary societies and got the message across through that magazine and in real music. So he used his influence for good. And he was a leading early force in that opposition. But again, uh, just fascinating that uh, Alexander just couldn't see how that was wrong. But he recognized instrumental music was unscriptural. And from what I gather, his widow wrote after he died that he never associated with a congregation that had instrumental music. 
even if they supported missionary society. Back then, there were some that had missionary societies but didn't have instrumental music. That eventually ended where today, if you go to a Christian church, which is what they're called, uh, there's a lot of differences. It's not just instrumental music. They, they, and they support both. Any questions on that so far? Again, we're getting into this division now, the controversy. Missionary society, instrumental music. Hey, is this scriptural? Hold on. I don't think we should be doing it. Other people say, oh, it's fine. Not today, no. Oh, well, there are that call themselves churches, but again, they're following into this pattern, yeah. So it can happen today. I went to a church in uh, Lubbock, checked to the uh, institutional church when I was in college at Lubbock, and it was sound, you know, and today I hear they have instrumental music in it. So it can happen today. It can't happen. It can happen any time. That's why we got to be aware of these issues, right? Yeah. Yep. Amen. Colbert Fanning wrote, The Church of Christ, he reckoned, the Church of Christ is the only divinely authorized missionary Bible, Sunday school temperance, and cooperation site. It's all the congregation. It's about the congregation, right? It's not about a society or an organization outside of that. Because guess what? A lot of times in the world, it's all about money, right? You create a society outside the congregation. You have a president. You have a secretary. They're getting paid. You're paying the missionaries. Money comes into play. Corruption. That's why God doesn't authorize that stuff. We'll talk about a few of these men that were involved in these controversies, opposing and, and supporting. Stephen? Again, it, op it opens it up because it's not a godly institution. It's a man-made... I mean, we have enough problems as it is following the pattern with our own desires and everything, our own failings. But when you totally uh, start introducing something into the church that's not meant, you know, organizationally, you're going to have problems of uh, corruption, fraud. I mean, that's going to happen. And I look at the history of these missionary societies. They didn't do all that good. They weren't that successful because, again, it's more about the money. There's another man that was involved in these controversies, Moses Lard, 1818 to 1880. Born in Tennessee, baptized in 1841, graduated at Bethany College. You're going to see a lot of these men came out of Bethany College, sat at the feet of Alexander Campbell and what he said. He wasn't influenced, though, by Alexander Campbell and missionaries. He saw... He saw um, or on the uh, instrumental music. He was opposed to it. During the war between the states, again, horrible times. Many brethren at this time, motions were so high in both the North and the South during the Civil War. People were willing to kill one another over the issue. And uh, many of the Christians, especially in the South, but many Christians everywhere, said we shouldn't be involved in this. Christians shouldn't be fighting against one another. Uh, it would be horrible for a Christian to kill another Christian in a war. And they, they said, no, we we're not going to have anything to do with it. What well, do you think that happened in a the society? They were faced with a lot of opposition, hatred. You're a coward. You, know, you don't love your country, right? He had to flee to Canada. He had to flee to Canada. I mean, these were horrible times, and, but he stood firm on that. I think I mentioned in one invitation once. I mean, these were horrible times, in Missouri especially, where I think Marie's from and stuff, uh, it was truly a war of brother against brother and a lot of guerrilla warfare in Missouri. And I read a story where a preacher, if you were pro-Confederate or pro-Union, I mean, you faced persecution, you could be shot very easily. And the federal authorities said that anyone associated with the Southern sympathies couldn't preach. You can't preach. You do, you'll go to jail. It's one preacher who... Was a path. He, he 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 didn't believe in either side. He shouldn't be involved, but yet somehow he's associated with the uh, Confederate cause. And they caught him, and his daughter wrote a statement. It was a heartbreaking. She wrote that they uh, some federal Union troops, government troops, came into their house. They caught him. They took him out, and the family knew what they're going to do. They're going to shoot him. 
And he, the daughter wrote, she said, she looked around at all these men, these soldiers, and was looking for any type of compassion in their eyes, sympathy that, please save my father, don't, don't kill him and everything. And she said, I saw no, no compassion in any of the eyes. And they took the uh, preacher out into the woods and shot him. And the type of times that they were living in. And afterwards, if you were a pro-Confederate, it was against the law for you to preach. You couldn't preach. You couldn't be a preacher. So horrible times. He was very influential in, uh, in uh, Missouri, though, but he did have to flee to Canada for a time. On instrumental music, he wrote the following, which I thought was really good. He says, what defense can be urged for the introduction into some of our congregations of instrumental music? The answer which thunders into my ear from every page of the New Testament is none. Did Christ ever appoint it? Did the apostles ever sanction it? Or did any one of the primitive churches ever use it? Never. In what light then must we view him who attempts to introduce it? I answer it as an insulter of the authority of Christ and as a defiant and impious innovator in the simplicity and purity of ancient worship. Pretty direct, isn't it? Pretty direct. Always opposed to it. He recognized that it was scriptural. Imagine the confusion, though, when you're sitting here and you're hearing all these different voices. Alexander Campbell saying it's all right. Others saying, no, it's not. And also hearing, okay, he, Moses, you're, you're, you're opposed missionary societies but, or, uh, to instrumental music, but you're okay with missionary society. And he was. Moses Lord was always said that was okay. I think, again, that tension that for unity, you want unity so bad, you're willing to overlook what you shouldn't. And I think for the sake of what they saw as unity, they, they compromised. And that was a mistake, which McGarvey, as I'll show later, recognized it was a mistake. Because there were a number of them that opposed instrumental music, but they allowed the missionaries to come in. And guess what? If you allow the missionary society, eventually you're going to have instrumental music. That's how it played out. These men tried not to do that. Like I said, Alexander Campbell wouldn't go to a congregation with instrumental music. But if they had missionary side, it's all right. And eventually, all of those introduced the organ into worship. Another nice one, Jacob Creeth, very uh, sound man, born in Virginia, lived most of his time in Missouri, great writer. One of the first, if not the first, to oppose missionary societies, called the Iron Duke, the Iron Duke of the Restoration. One Christian wrote, here is another man in undeserved obscurity. He opposed missionary societies and instrumental music. He saw you couldn't separate the two. That both was a departure from what? The pattern. The pattern. What's our pattern? The pattern is the New Testament. And those both are departures from New Testament uh, worship. Protest arose right after the formation of missionary societies. Jacob Creeth Jr. objected the loudest because he believed the church should do what the societies tried to do. Creeth argued vehemently that Scripture did not authorize the use of conventions or other similar organizations. He understood. He saw that the two were tied together. He couldn't break up the two. But imagine these great men in the church are saying, oh, you can. This music's wrong. Missionary societies are right. A lot of confusion. That's why these magazines were so important because they were showing the different viewpoints. Readers were reading it. Who's going to be influenced for what? Good or bad, right? Again, influence. Is our influence good today or bad? Is our congregation's influence good or bad today? One of my favorites that I really like, Benjamin Franklin. He was a distant relative of the famous Benjamin Franklin, born in Ohio. Unlike a lot of these others, from the border states or southern states. He was from, like Alexander Campbell, they were from farther north. He's in Ohio. He was baptized a co-worker uh, by a co-worker of Stone in 1833. Editor of the American Christian Review from 1856 to 78. You had three, four, we'll see all of them, magazines that were really where the battles were raged. People would show their positions, what they saw the Bible as saying. Gospel Advocate and the American Christian Review were strong in opposition of missionary societies and instrumental music. They were unscriptural, and they would have writers trying to defend that position. You would have uh, 
as we're going to see in a magazine called The Christian Standard, who was opposed to it. They agreed that missionary societies and later on they, that instrumental music was fine. It was an expedient. It wasn't an addition. It was expedient. That was their argument, which we know is false. Great debater and preacher, very brilliant man. He was a central figure with, for the most influence for good in the North. Had some great articles. At first, early on, he, he supported missionary society, especially when Alexander Campbell approved it. But he studied it, and he found out fairly quickly, oh, this is not, this is like instrumental music. It's an addition. It's something that we, that we came out of. We don't want to go back into it. I'll let you read those and, uh, and everything, but McGarvey, who is another one we'll see, just one of the greatest scholars in the Christian, I mean, even denominationalists will say McGarvey is one of the greats. David Liscombe below said, earnestness, clearness, simplicity, with a strong reverence for and determination, and you know, nothing in all religion save what the Bible teaches was a striking characteristic of his discourses. Should be us, right? It's our great desire, reverence for the Word and to gain knowledge and to live by it, right? We want to live by the Bible. So his magazine, one in uh, Tennessee, Gospel Advocate, were writing these articles trying to suppress the influence of Alexander Campbell about missionary societies. It's interesting, too, the main focus is missionary societies, not instrumental music. Most, most of it, even the ones that approved of missionary societies disapproved of uh, instrumental music. Like I said, even Alexander Campbell till the day he died. But those that use influence for good, here's one that used it for ill. Yeah, wrong button. You've heard of this one, Stephen? Isaac Errett, born in New York City, baptized in 1833. He became editor of the Christian Standard magazine from 1866 to 88. It was farther north. It was another magazine. But this magazine, he came to the conclusion and he had writers write defending missionary societies and instrumental music, saying they're right. Imagine a, 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 you know, just a common farmer, Christian, who trying to make sense of all this. These great men are saying this and what I did. Well, they should be going to the Bible, right? But again, men have influence for good or ill. We can try to deny that, but we're influenced by people with, easily. We want to be influenced by those who base their opinions on the Bible, right? That's the one we want to listen to. So these great debates for years, for, from 1865 to 1906, was going on about how do we, uh, do we fellowship this? Uh, are they Christians? Or is it all right to have instrumental music? Is it expedient? No, it's not. Yes, it is. It's going back, back and forth, back and forth. Um, one of the, I'll throw this in now, one of the reasons why when the split did happen, the vast majority of churches in the North apostatized and put in instrumental music and missionary societies. And one of the reasons I think is, I guess he died in 1888. Benjamin Franklin, his primary uh, opponent to this, you know, in the magazines and stuff, Benjamin Franklin, he died fairly early on. When he died, that magazine lost a lot of influence. So he basically you had most people just hearing one side of the story, Christian standard. It's all right to have instrumental music. It's expedient. It's scriptural. Another great one, J.W. McGarvey. You've heard of him. <laughs> How many has heard of McGarvey? Yeah, yeah. He is, he is very admirable. His uh, commentary on Acts can't beat it. Um, even denominationalist will. Born in Kentucky, another graduate of Bethany College. Few superiors as a teacher. Wrote many excellent books, commentary on Acts. Again, supported missionary societies, opposed instrumental music till the day he died. I heard the story, I don't know if it's true, but I think I read it in, in uh, one of the books where when all these innovations were coming in and, and it became apparent most of the churches were going to put instrumental music in. He didn't approve of it. He didn't place membership at any congregation that had instrumental music, but he would fellowship with those that had missionary societies supported that. 
when he died during his funeral at the congregation, they had a instrumental music played. And one of the ladies, older ladies that was there mentioned that he would, Brother McGarvey would not be happy if he saw what was going on at his funeral. He would not be happy. People want to do what they want to do a lot of times, though, won't they? Um, and if he had to, again, I think his desire for unity to, to keep the peace kept him from condemning uh, the missionary society. And he recognized that, as we're going to see, right before he died. He recognized he should have should have posed to it because he saw that everyone that supported missions their side, they also supported instrumental music, which she always opposed. Fanning Ander Tate in 56 wrote, when McGarvey died on October 11, 1911, he was an acknowledged leader of the conservative scholarship of the world in the field of biblical criticism. His technical equipment in this field was second to none. Even the liberals and modernists with whom he crossed swords, respected his unique talents and his superb abilities in both Old and New Testament. This is an interesting story here. A lot to learn from this here. This is McGarvey. Brother Sewell, who was a Christian preacher back at the turn of the century when he was a young man, wrote this. He said in, or it said, in 1950, Brother Sewell, in a Harding College lecture, recalled the following advice given to him by Brother McGarvey back in 1902. It's advice preachers today might ponder. He wrote, he told this, McGarvey told this young preacher, you're on the right road and whatever you do, don't let anyone persuade you that you cannot, that you can successfully combat error by fellowshipping it and going along with it. I have tried. I have tried. I believe at the start that, I believe at the start that was the only way to do it. I've never held membership in a congregation that used instrumental music. I have, however, accepted invitations to preach without distinction between churches that used it, churches that didn't. I've gone along with their papers and magazines and things of that sort. During all these years, I have taught the truth as the New Testament does and every young preacher who has passed through the College of the Bible, I've taught it. Yet I do not know more than six of these men who are preaching the truth today. It won't work. I think every person who wants to become a pre preacher should read that. I don't think so, Stephen. After having won the battle by teaching against instruments, McGarvey admitted he had lost the war by fellowshipping those churches that did. Again, that love of unity overpowered us seeing that it wasn't true unity. Tensions are good, but they weren't correct. They weren't, they weren't according to Scripture. Another great voice opposed to these innovations and these additions to worship into the church was David Lipscomb, brilliant man. Sickly man, he always thought he was going to die young. Every year he thought he was going to die that year, and he lived to be a pretty old man, David Lipscomb. Born in Tennessee, baptized by Tolbert Fanning, co-editor with Fanning in the Gospel Advocate, most influential preacher in the South. Again, Gospel Advocate and its influence, like the... Christian standard for the other side helped the South to kind of stay firm in the faith because of their influence. Posed both missionary societies and instrumental music. He, he was a pacifist too, believed Christians should not vote or participate in the government in any way. Can't be a can't be a member of the church or a, can't be a, can't be a member of the military or anything like that. Remember when I joined the Air Force? Even today, there's some that really hold to that. I had a preacher and. New Mexico it told me, don't do it. Don't join the military. Christians shouldn't be doing it. Again, a matter of opinion, but some hold to it very strongly. And I could see the influence too. Again, these men are coming out of the war between the states where, where thousands of men died uh, in, in a war. And he saw Tennessee and a lot of the South just totally destroyed. Totally, the economy's destroyed. Some of the richest states in the Union before the war were Mississippi, Tennessee, what are some of the poorest states in the Union today in Mississippi? They, their economies never recovered. These men took a stand saying we shouldn't be involved with this, a war. And he suffered for it. He was accused by the uh, United States government of being a Confederate sympathizer and almost hung. And guess what? Confederate government accused him of being a Northern government sympathizer and uh, they almost hung him. So he got it from both sides. 
And I think that kind of influences his thinking too. Like, it shouldn't have anything to do with the government. It's, it's not good. <laughs> and he understood these basic rules. New Testament is, the once, is at once the rule and limit of our faith in worship to God. Our rule limits man's worship to the exercises approved from the Bible. Prayer, praise, thanksgiving, singing, making melody in our heart unto the Lord are acts of worship ordained of God. Yet no authority do we find for the instrument. Again, if we do open to the door to expediency, where shall welcome it? Why stop at the organ? I, this, this is a prophet before his own time. Why stop there? Missionary societies, why stop there? Well, it's just an expedient. Well, it's just expedient. It's just in there, but it didn't. If we can make an inanimate object as the organ answer to as a substitute for singing, why not do one for praying? Counting beads is the same character of a substitute for praying that the organ is for singing. Good point. I never thought of that. Substitute for praying, just use the rosary beads. Whatever Jesus found in Judaism that he approved, he retained it in Christian worship. Whatever disapproved, he left it out, failing to adopt it in the Christian worship. When Christ dropped it out, who dares place it in? James Harding, another one. Writer for the Gospel Advocate, strong opponent of instrumental music and missionary societies. Famous debate with the Baptist uh, Moody in Nashville. Thousands attended this. Thousands attended this. Uh, I wanted to go back to David Liscombe, too, right before I go on to Harding, too. Times were so difficult then. Imagine this from, uh, from David Liscombe, who loved the Bible so much. He loved it so much. And right after the war, uh, uh, a brother in Missouri wrote to him asking that, you know, we're, I have, we have a bunch of Bibles we've donated, you know, where can we send it to? And he wrote back and say, it's very nice of you, brother, but right now we don't need Bibles, we need food. He says we're starving. We have enough Bibles, but we need food. Imagine that, it's hard times. He was also renowned after the war. They had a yellow fever. I believe it was yellow fever. Yeah, the times they lived in then. They're talking about polio, young, having a fear of polio when we were young. We are so fortunate now not to worry about. Back then in the South, he had yellow fever, cholera. They had a yellow fever outbreak in Nashville. I think they had a population of like 40,000 in Nashville at the time, like 5,000 people died. Well, that's an epidemic, that's, that's, that's bad. And he uh, was noted by the civic leaders, the mayor and everything, for his outstanding work in bringing comfort to these people that were sick with the yellow fever and everything. Because a lot of people were scared. They thought it was catching, and they would just avoid so when it had it. And he went down there and uh, helped these people out. So it showed his Christian heart, to He loved all men. Okay, so a good one here. Alexander Carr, very good debater with the Baptists. It helped the church grow greatly in Tennessee at the time and uh, a good editor for Gospel Advocate. You know what, I think we'll, we don't have too much time left. Do you want to just go through or do you want to take a little break? What's that? Need, you want to go on or break? I think we can finish in probably about half an hour or so. You want to go? Okay, we'll keep on going. So, uh, Alexander. Study him if you get a chance. I won't say much on him, but he was very influential. Then one of one I, one I really like too, good Christian man, T. B. Larimore. Have you ever heard of him, Stephen? He was very influential in Tennessee, uh, Alabama. That's where he grew up. Reason why the churches of Christ in northern Alabama are so strong now, I think, is because of his influence for the good. Again, you can see. Uh, I'll show you a map later. You can see where the churches of Christ are, are concentrated now. A lot of it is where these men preached. Again, influence for good, right? And Isaac, Eric, and those that preached in the north, the churches fell away. Fewer churches up there. He was born in Tennessee. He was baptized while he was in the army, in the Confederate Army in 1864. He began preaching in 1866. I think that made a big impact on him, fighting in the war, seeing all the death and everything. He opened up Mars Hills College in Florence, Alabama. To this day, you go to northern Alabama, I mean, there's a Church of Christ on just about every street corner. I mean, they're all over the place. 
one of the most eloquent preachers of his day. He I, evidently, you, if you didn't cry at one of his sermons, you probably had a hard heart evidently because he really moved people. Talk about emotionalism, but it was based on scripture, but he moved people. He moved people. There's a pr picture of a, here of a, the first meeting house he ever saw, church that he attended. Looks a little rickety. H. Leo Bowles in Gospel Advocate in 30 wrote, one has described him as follows. On his face there was a settled expression of goodness and melancholy which touched the hearts of the people with a feeling of sympathy and love. There was an indescribable and irresistible pathos in his voice, manner, and general appearance which melted audiences to tears and moved hearts long hardened by sin to repent at the appeal of the gospel. He preached where the opportunity was given him. He preached in schoolhouses, under brush arbors and log cabins. He baptized hundreds of people and established many congregations in the hill country of Alabama in a short time. I think one of the reasons, he had periods where he almost you could say he might have had depression or something because he, he experienced that a lot. One of the things was they said that when he preached, he had a brother that was in the Confederate Army too who, uh, probably was killed, but they never found the body. So he never knew what happened to his brother. They say every meeting until the day he died, he would always search the faces to see if he recognized the face of his brother. So that's kind of sad. At the closing of his school at Mars Hill in 1887, he gave his entire time to preaching the gospel. His field of labor increased and the calls for his service multiplied until he had much more work than he could possibly do. Perhaps he preached more sermons to more hearers and baptized more people than any other preacher of his day. T.B. Larimore, remember him. He traveled extensively and preached in Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia, you know, all these states. He preached from Maine to Mexico and Canada to Cuba. He preached the word everywhere. This was kind of showing the... Uh, Schedule. I can imagine we have a meeting, gospel meeting for a week, right? That's a long time. Now we're cutting it back even to three days sometimes, right? He had a meeting in Los Angeles, three months. Imagine going to a gospel meeting every night for three months. Three months. Preach two lessons each day and three on Sundays. 120 people were baptized in that three months. How did they do it? I don't know. They had strong constitutions, that's for sure. There's a picture of a baptism near Mars Hill, Alabama. As you notice, if you look real close, a lot of the people were barefoot. You see the girls are dressed in their finest Sunday clothes there too. Daniel Summer. You've heard of him too, right, Steve? Interesting character, Daniel Summer. A lot of things to learn. Lived a long time, 90 years, 1850, 1940. His mother earned a living by making clothes for the, uh, for the slaves at the time on plantations. His mother would make clothes for them. He's born in Maryland, attended Bethany College. One of the first, again, to prominent and opposing missionary societies and instrumental music. He was a close associate of Benjamin Franklin. When Benjamin Franklin died, remember that influence for him was lost. Daniel Summer tried to fill those shoes, but he created a lot of controversy too because as you can see that last point, he didn't believe in, uh, he opposed located preachers. So that caused a division within those opposing the Missionary Society and Israel Music. So in addition to the ordered churches that were falling away, the ones that were remaining faithful now had to contend with another issue and that hurt the cause of Christ. You know, later on, I'm studying, later on in his life, he, he saw that uh, he was a little too strident in that. He made that too much of a contention. He recognized that. And it caused division, a little strife between him and his children. Because his children brought up what he taught them and they didn't, they, they held to that. And they, they kind of resented his father for starting to think about that. Parker, uh -huh. what's the located preacher concept? That is that a preacher should not be uh, should not be located at one congregation. That they are supposed to be traveling around and, uh, and one congregation shouldn't have a paid preacher. If I'm right, that's the basic gist of it, right? Yeah. 
I would think so too, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe this is a little overreaction. And he made it more of a, you better believe this way. And that caused a lot of debate in a lot of Christians. So, you know, you can believe that, but don't make that a test of fellowship. Especially when we have all these other issues going on that the Bible says. Uh, and, of course, we know the located, you know, Paul approves of it and stuff too. But, again, I think it is an overreaction because he was very strongly opposed to instrumental music missionary side. He organized a Sand Creek meeting in 1889. That was one of the first events where Christians came together to oppose these innovations coming in. People were seeing an instrument was coming in almost every Sunday. There was a congregation all of a sudden had an instrument in their worship service, whether you liked it or not, whether you liked it or not. Almost 6,000 attended that uh, meeting. Some are charged the innovators with being responsible for all the division, discord, bitterness, and strife within the church. He claimed they had constantly asked men not to push their innovations, but they had refused, which is true. Which is true. The missionary side and instrumental music were being pushed into churches, driving a wedge between the brethren. Very true. He... He uh, took over the uh, magazine that Benjamin Franklin had too, but never had the success that Benjamin Franklin, or the influence that Benjamin Franklin had with his magazine. Another one of my favorite, Austin McGarry. He was a rough character. He didn't get baptized and he was fairly old. Or in the, he served in the Confederate Army with the son of Sam Houston. Served as sheriff in the 1870s. And I guess he was a rough one. You didn't mess with him. You did not mess with him. He founded the Firm Foundation in 1884. I don't even know if that's, it was a big one when I was a young Christian. I, I subscribed to it, but you know, it went very much with rural women, it was very liberal. Uh, but uh, Austin would have been horrified, but I don't even know if it's a magazine anymore, do you? I'm not sure, I'm not sure either. Yeah, I'm not sure either. He founded the Firm Foundation magazine in 1884, strong opponent, again, of the innovations of instrumental music missionary societies. And because of that, we're going to see most of the churches in Texas remain faithful, again, because of his influence, influence for good. So don't think your influence is not important. Even if you don't, you're not an editor of a magazine, your influence as a Christian is vital, each and every one of us says, as Lipscomb was to Tennessee, McGarry was to Texas. So had all these years where we're talking, and these men, brilliant men, are different sides of the argument, what is Christian, you know, you see Christian trying to sort this out. What's the answer? Okay, I'm listening to what these men say now. i got to go to the Bible and study it, right? A lot of people didn't do that, though. They listened to Alexander Campbell, to Isaac Eric. A lot of these churches started having innovations, putting these in, missionary societies and instrumental music. By 1906, it was pretty much complete. Reason why I say 1906, the only reason why is because a government official, 1906, was doing census, and he heard, hey, I heard that the Christian church has split, that there's a, there's a fellowship issue now between the churches. And he asked uh, David Lipscomb about it. And Lipscomb finally had to admit what was reality for many years. He said, yes, there's a, there's a, a uh, split in fellowship here. There's a, there's a division. And the churches that are opposed to missionary societies and instrumental music generally are calling themselves churches of Christ. Those brethren who allow instrumental music in a missionary society are generally called Christian churches. And that's true today, too. And it's not a fast rule, too. There's a Church of Christ in Mount Vernon. You go in there, and guess what? There's an organ in there. Been that way for 100 years. They followed that first innovation. They just kept the name Churches of Christ. But generally, ones that were known as Churches of Christ are the ones that, that say instrumental music, missionary society is wrong. Interesting, too, when this happened, the split happened, the only difference between our brethren, when there are big differences, we see it just doesn't seem that way to people. The only difference was in instrumental music missionary society. Today, the Christian church is one of the most liberal denominations in the world. I mean, they advocate homosexual preachers. They advocate uh, women as elders. They don't even say you have to be baptized anymore. You don't even have to believe in Jesus to 
go to the Christian church now. You don't have to believe Jesus is the Son of God. Just come and you're welcome because we're all united. Interesting that Christian church, some of them, people in a Christian uh, standard magazine, they couldn't even go that far. They had to split among themselves. Some of them said, no, we can't go that far. We can have instrumental music and missionary side, but we can't say you don't have to believe in Jesus. So today you have three groups that came out of this vision. The Churches of Christ, us, who we believe took a stand on the Bible. That if you're going to be a New Testament church, we follow the pattern that Alexander Campbell, Thomas Campbell, people before him said we need to do to be Christians. Follow the pattern. Our Bible is our authority, nothing else. You have the Christian church or churches of Christ, some of them still call themselves Church of Christ, who are conservative in the sense that the big difference is instrumental music, missionary societies. But even they are drifting away from that. There's a lot more differences than that now. And then you have the Disciples of Christ Christian Church who are so liberal. It's amazing. And they're dying. They're dying. They're losing members right and left because they don't stand for anything at all. They don't stand for anything and they're dying. So division's complete. Starting to wrap up here. Divisions are complete. Showing how the apostasy was. Apostasy in the first century, right? Apostasy in a hundred years ago, or over a hundred years ago now. Kentucky, look at that. 1906, only 9% of the brethren remained faithful. 123,000 in the Christian church, 12,000 in Church of Christ. 9% remained faithful. 9%. Reminds me of the uh, spies, how many spies had the faith and how many didn't. Always a minority, right, too, right? Always a minority. Arkansas, a little bit farther south, so the influence of uh, Firm Foundation, McGarry, and Lipscomb, a little bit stronger, so it's almost split. 52% remained faithful. Tennessee, because of the influence for good of Campbell or of uh, Lipscomb and others, for uh, 73% remained faithful. Look at Indiana, the northern states, Christian church, only 8% remained faithful. 8%. Alabama, because of Laramore, and still it was pretty much split. Oklahoma, 25% faithful. Again, these are just numbers. I'm sure there are members that Christians that weren't faithful and stuff, but these were the ones that left that stayed in the churches of Christ. It didn't put the innovations in. Um, I believe so. I get it out of Humble's uh, book. I'll show you the book I get the figures out of. I think it was based out of census. Because back then, they, they yeah, back then religion was very important, so they did uh, do a lot of this thing. They don't do that anymore. Missouri, look at Missouri. 159,000. Again, because some of these men opposed instrumental music, but they allowed missionary society. So they believed in that, and so they both... They both are joined together. Only 4% Missouri. Texas, 73% remained faithful because of McGarry and the Firm Foundation, that, their influence. And that's a lesson for us too, not to be influenced, right? Except by the Bible. <laughs> Try not to. If you're going to be influenced, influence someone you recognize is teaching the truth. Ohio, 5%. Illinois, 3%. To this day, Christian churches are very common in, in Missouri, uh, Illinois, Indiana. So guess what happens after this? Any questions on any of that? Okay, so you have division. Oh, sister. What's that? Uh-huh. Yeah. Denominations are, are organizations that, you know, if you study the Bible, it should just be Christian, right? We should just be Christian. But you have people, especially in this time, too, you're either a Baptist or Presbyterian or Lutheran or Catholic. That's who you identified with. Not as Christian. 
but as a Baptist or something like that. No, we're Christians, right? We just want to be followers of Jesus. That was the New Testament plea. Think so, Stephen? I mean, that's the basic thing. Okay, so guess what, though? See it in the Bible? We see it in the first century? We see it now. You have apostasy. What follows apostasy? Unity and growth. 1906, 159,000 members, like 45, 1 million. Fastest growing religious group in the nation. Look Magazine had a big article. It was a big magazine back in the 50s. Growing like you wouldn't believe. Over a million members. Uh, it just grew greatly. And because uh, we were united and uh, we would went through that split and there was relief. You know, we know who our brethren are, who are loyal to the cause. And now we're united. We're going to preach the word. And it, it worked. It was an effective message. So from 1906 to 45 or so, roughly, 1950, unity and growth. Some of the men during this time, uh, Philo, I like that name, Philo, Sirigli, Sirigli, I guess. He was the uh, brother of another Sirigli, born in Alabama, attended Mars Hill, where T.B. Larimore was, baptized over 2,000 individuals, participated in over 24 debates. Wow. Go through these a little quick. Like I said, if you have your notes, and uh, it says he rates high, especially in the clearness of position, strength of his arguments, vigor of his oratory, and wit, humor, repertoire, and antecedent. He is inexhaustible and inanswerable. Wouldn't mess with him in a debate. You'd probably get beat. One of the reasons why the church grow, again, God raised up men who are willing to preach the word and do it effectively. Influence for good. And one of my favorites, Jefferson Davis Tent. He was always getting in trouble because he was a down-to-earth guy and he would use a lot of farm language sometimes. And some people would take issue with that. <laughs> and he never learned, evidently. And he'd have to apologize. He'd have to apologize because he would... He was from the farm, I guess, and had some farm terms. Converted from the Methodist Church. I read a book on him, a biography, if you're ever interested. I mean, this man never made a penny off the gospel. Never made a penny. He, he, but you tell what he loved. That was the gospel, and he preached it. He didn't make any money off the gospel. You know, you turn on the TV, too, and hear preachers on TV now, and they got jets and million-dollar mansions. I guarantee you this guy didn't. He just preached the gospel. Responsible for a lot of congregations in Texas. Baptized over 8,000 people. Known for his blunt and plain spoken language. Famous for ending many of his written phrases. He always knew the danger. Writing phrases, he'd end it with, Brethren, we are drifting. Let's go back. Let's go back to the God. Well, I know you sound like a good idea, but is it biblical? We're drifting. His son is uh, Fanning. Fanning tent, right? He's a preacher. I, I don't think he's alive anymore, is he? Yeah, I think he died. Jefferson Davis tent. He was named after Jefferson Davis, a Confederate president. Um, in that book about him, it was interesting. Again, in the hardships of the war when Sherman marched through uh, Georgia. And, he had a story that uh, when he was eight years old and the troops marched through and they just burned and, uh, and looted everything. And they could tell that the soldiers could tell that uh, Jefferson had uh, uh, loved this little puppy. It was one of them. And they took that dog and shot it right in front of him. <laughs> Said it left a mark on him. <laughs> uh, he was an example of contending earnestly for the faith. There are many other things in which J.D. Tant is a good example for gospel preachers. He was an example of bravery, sincerity, charity, loyalty, sacrifice, humor, and many more wonderful Christian virtues. It would be a good way to, for someone to say about our lives, right? Hopefully they'll say the same thing about us. Foy Wallace. I guess you're not related, right? Uh, another sad... I knew his uh, granddaughter. She's a doctor now in uh, North Dakota, but went to church together when went to the institutional churches. His granddaughter, nice gal. They liked her and her husband. Did a lot of things together. It was her, her grandfather. 
He was born in Texas, baptized in 1909. Powerful preacher from what I gather. Powerful preacher, author of many books. Great debater. Uh, editor of the Gospel uh, Advocate from 30 to 34. Again, used his influence for good. Stopped it. He was really responsible. The, church, the church has had a problem with premillennialism coming in, error coming in. One of the editors of the Gospel Advocate started preaching it, and he pounced on it real quick. And he was responsible for really nipping it in the bud. Even to this day, you go to Indiana and a few places back there, there's some churches of Christ in the Louisville area that are premillennialists because of his influence for bad. But he had a, a great debate with one of the preachers who had that position on premillennialism, and he just showed the, the fallacy, the fallacy of it, is it not biblical? And because of that, it never was a serious issue in the church. Sad thing, again, that we can learn lessons from of Floyd Wallace was when we get to the next division on institutionalism, which is basically Christian uh, missionary society's light, basically what it is. Foy Wallace, when this started happening, he opposed it. This is not scriptural. Uh, we shouldn't be having these uh, uh, churches supporting, uh, other churches giving support to one church and let them dole out the money. No, every church should do that on their own. And he opposed that, opposed the churches doing that. All of, but he started to see in what he was writing is what, what the, most of the churches wanted to hear. If you held that position, you're not going to get a preaching job. You're not going to be invited to gospel meetings. You're not going to get paid. Guess what? A lot of the preachers, they shut their mouths up. Because guess who was supporting it? Gospel Advocate. The one that helped the churches be faithful in the 1860s, opposing instrumental music. Now they were supporting institutions kitchens and, uh, and uh, support for orphans' homes through the churches. He saw the hand went on the wall and he caved in. He shut his mouth. Isn't that sad? Shut it out. He could have been such a good influence and stopped many, I'm convinced many church, more churches, probably not the majority, but many more would have stayed faithful if he had used that influence. But he, I guess he saw that it wasn't going to work and he was comfortable with the living it was making. I don't know what his reasons were, but it hurt the cause. So again, we had that vision after apostasy, growth, just like in the first century. Now we have division again. Herald of Truth. Missionary society again, except this time only one congregation. You'll have a big congregation. All these little congregations, we'll send money to them, to that congregation. They will have people who will run it and they will determine who to give money to to be a missionary. Same thing as a missionary site, basically. Herald of Truth was a big one down in Texas. Fellowship Halls. Let's make a social gospel. Let's bring people in. With the gospel, well, that'll come later. Let's bring them in with food, with coffee. Let's entertain them. They'll bring people in. No. What, what's going to bring people with open hearts in? Gospel, right? Gospel message. That's what we want to hear. That's how you become a Christian. Church support of children's homes. That sounds great. People recall orphan hater. Oh, you don't support missionaries? So you're an orphan or a uh, orphan's home. You're a orphan. Hey, you hate orphans. I heard that when I was in the institutional churches. Where's the support for that? What does the Bible say? Take care of the, who is that to? That's for us individually, isn't it? But that's simple. It's simple when you look at it. People didn't want to hear that. I went to a congregation that had that ran a children's home. I can I can guarantee you there's abuses there. A lot of abuses, violence, abuse of the children. Because people are hired. They're not doing that out of love. They're hired. It's a job for them, making money. Church support of colleges, Harding College, Pepperdine, all of these. Uh, founded by Christians, had good principles, you know, Christian education. But all of a sudden, people, especially associated with the gospel advocate, started saying, uh, uh, we should do that. We should support this. It's a good idea. It helps the churches grow. Support this big congregation over here. Give money to them, and they'll take care of everything for you. He was a prof 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 uh, 
prolific writer, uh, a lot of them, uses influence. One of the first preachers after the aggression to promote church cooperation and institutionalism. He's the first one that really started pushing this. Before then, a few churches did it, but it was, they knew that it, you know, they're gonna, there's going to be issues with other churches that they did it. He's the first one that started really promoting it. And when the gospel advocate jumped on board, guess what? If you opposed it, you're going to lose your job probably. He reported and said in 1938 at the ACC lectures that any church without ACC in the budget has the wrong preacher. A little implied threat there. There were men that opposed to that, though, that used their influence for good. Roy Codgell wrote that book, New Testament Church. You've seen that one, right, Tyler? New Testament Church. I remember George up in White Rock. He had a hard time speaking, so timid and everything, but he would use the New Testament church for a Bible class, and he always did a good job because he used that outline. It's a really good book for any Christian to use for teaching. Born in Oklahoma, he was a lawyer. Should like that, to Nick. He was a lawyer. One of the leading opponents of institutionalism, uh, wrote the New Testament church, participated in 68, they had a meeting with, again, we want unity and stuff. So they had a meeting with these pre preachers. Again, it, we're still debating this, even in the 60s, trying to convince Codgell and men like that, trying to convince our brethren that, hey, what you're doing is wrong. It's a departure. It's going to lead to even worse things. So they had a meeting. Nothing much came of it, really. David Lipscomb knew about this, too. He would have been opposed. He wrote, what... What was that, the sponsoring church concept, but the organization of a society and the elders of this church? That's the organization. That's the society. That's the cooperation. The elders of the church, they determine where that congregation's money goes to. Not some guy 100 miles, 500 miles away who has a paid job being paid. Does that make sense? Okay. Another one who opposed it and was very influential for good in the early times this was the editor of the Truth Magazine from 62 to 76. Gave at least five debates, strong opponent of liberalism in the church. Mike Willis's brother, I thought, wrote a good thing. Cecil, again, was just a man, and he fell into a little scandal at one point in his life uh, with, uh, with his marriage and everything, and he fell, basically. And Fida Clay, Mike Willis's brother wrote, 97, feet of clay. He died in 97, right after he died, his brother wrote that. He said, even the greatest of men among us at feet of clay, sometimes one admires a man so much that his faith is shaken when he becomes aware of some weakness of the man's character and of the times that he stumbles into sin. Were Cecil living today, he would agree with this assessment of men with a bowed head, acknowledged in his own failures. And he repented, that. from what I gather, at the very end, he repented. I think he got a church job with a small congregation and uh, he repented of that sin of, and uh, came back but it was sad but again we don't follow the man do we the man's going to let, let us down but he he did much good uh, and probably saved many churches through his influence from digressing into institutionalism then one of the last ones was the son of uh, Jefferson David Davis Tent and he died in 97 too Graduated David Lipscomb, Gospel Guard. That was another big magazine that opposed innovations at the time. Uh, held uh, debates uh, and opposed institutions. So very influential editor and stuff. Again, even up through the 70s, 80s, even when I was a Christian, 80s and up till the 90s, I'd say magazines were very important um, for influence, whether good or bad. You don't have that now for good or bad too because of the internet. They've lost their influence. Homer Haley, opposed institutionalism, was one of the big proponents uh, for staying faithful to the gospel. Uh, brilliant Old Testament scholar wrote uh, commentaries. I have a couple of them on Daniel, the Minor Prophets, Isaiah, Revelation. Later years, though, when this next apostasy happened with institutionalism, he openly uh, had other arguments for divorce and remarriage that weren't scriptural caused a lot of churches to have problems. 
I hear one of the reasons for this, I might be wrong, I hope it's not gossip, but I heard that one of his family members was involved in scriptural marriage and it, it influenced him from what I gather. I don't know if that's true. If it's not, forgive me, but it's probably true. How many times has family influenced our decisions? <laughs> Uh, I also believed in the annihilation of the wicked. But again, he had a, such a great influence for good, like Alexander Campbell on the institutional question. Later years, though, promoted things that weren't good. And finally, happy now, finally, the last person we'll talk about, and I really like this guy. He saw it all. He went from the very, when the church was just starting to have the first apostasy up to the, the vision, to the period of growth, to the next apostasy. Uh, with institutionalism, and that was William Wesley Odie. I think it's Odie, right? Odie, not Ote, Odie. Very old, see how long he lived, 1867 to 61. So he's in his 90s when he died. He saw it all. Born in Virginia. Uh, he was involved with Benjamin Franklin's magazine, American Christian Reviews, Opposition to the Missionary Society. And that greatly influenced him, Benjamin Franklin's work. He wrote for all these magazines. You name all the ones we we're talking about that were faithful, he, he was part of it. Firm Foundation, Gospel Advocate, Gospel Guardian, uh, Bible Banner, American Christian View, Autographic Review, which was the follow-on that Daniel Summer had. He was associated with Daniel Summer for a while. He, he, he named it. I like that picture of him when he was young. And time changes everything, doesn't it? It's going to happen to us all. But he remained faithful the whole time. He never wavered one way or the other. There's his, uh, there's his gravestone with his wife. Married for 70 years, over 70 years. Imagine that. Wrote many books. I just read the book on, uh, which, where is it here? The Tree of Life Lost and Regained. Nice, simple, basic book. Kind of an outline of the whole Bible, briefly. Really nice, nice work. If you ever get a chance, read that one. Staunch opponent of institutionalism, married his wife for over 70 years. Like what they said about him. There's no way to evaluate the influence of such a life. He held hundreds, perhaps thousands of gospel meetings, many at his own expense, led thousands to the Lord, which was his aim in his preaching and writing. Though he did so much writing, it never returned him a cent, but cost him much. He never earned enough money again to pay income taxes and had no social security at the end. He did not have to accept welfare or charity at the end for faithful friends sent again and again to his needs. He felt that perhaps the Lord was making up for some of the lean years. Perhaps he was. May God bless his memory. In 1889 or 1891, he had his first taste of public controversy with the first aggression with the instrumental music. When he tried to ask some that supported it, some of the digressives, a few questions, they refused to answer him, saying he was not sincere. The writer wrote, how often have the forces of evil used that dodge? 1,075,000 and 9,000 congregations. Compare that with conservative congregations like ours, 142, 2,000, about 10%. Does that remind you of something familiar from the first digression in the 1900? Almost the same split, isn't it? Seems like there's always going to be that remnant. Isn't it amazing in the Bible? Faithful, how many of the, uh, again, the spies, as Ethan told me, were faithful? How many weren't faithful? Majority weren't. Noah's time, how many were faithful? Vast majority weren't. Eight souls. Faithful tribes, two. It seems like it's just always uh, something that works out in the nature of man that most are going to go for innovation, go with what they want to do and not what the Lord says. But as Paul says, he always has a remnant, right? God always has that remnant, the faithful. Guarantee you, they'll be there till the day he dies. And to our shame too, we, we divide, don't we? Matters of opinion that people try to say are doctrinal. We can go to the other extreme like summer, right? Those who say you don't believe in classes, you don't, shouldn't have... Bible classes. There's a lot of congregations like that in Texas, Oklahoma. One cup. One cuppers. Premillennialists too. That's to our shame, showing we need Jesus. 
and need to listen to his word to uh, because those people go the other extreme and say, if you don't do this, then, well, where's the scripture for that? Got to have one cup. Well, you're getting a little too literal there. What's the meaning? It's contents of the cup, right? Not the cup, contents. And there are some, some in these groups that will fellowship with us and stuff, but many don't. That's why, uh, but how again do we distinguish that? That's matters of opinion, right? That's a big thing we have to that causes division. We can't determine what's, we have to determine what's expedient and what is a matter of doctrine. And also, uh, if it's a matter of opinion, do, you, do I bind it on someone else when it's just a matter of opinion? Like, like being a pacifist or being a premillennialist or one cupper. No, those are trying to tie that and make it a matter of doctrine. And we can't do that. We have to go back to the Bible. I think a good example of how we can come to unity on these differences of opinion, and most times, I don't know, the ones I've come across, the, the, uh, the churches or people who believe that women should have head covering, uh, most of those Christians will not make that a, a question of faith. I mean, the congregations were 20, 30% of the congregation of women believed that, and they wore the head covering. They were fine with people that didn't, and the people were fine with them wearing it. It's a matter of opinion, right? And we got to determine that's what we learn from history and stuff, to know what's expedient, what is a matter of faith, what is opinion, what is doctrine. And that takes study, doesn't it? That's why you're here for too. Maybe that will help us a little bit to recognize, recognize that. And again, if you're interested in some of these books, let me uh, know. And, oh, no located preacher, Steve, you'll like that one. 120, so it's not real common anymore to um, cause, cause if you really study out, you can see what the Bible says about it. So finally, 2023, I marked out, it took me a while to do a few years ago. These are the conservative churches in the U.S., about over, close to two, over 2,000 of them. Isn't it interesting? Kind of a belt right down there. Guess where all these men that I'm talking about, where they preached, they had their influence? Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, Texas, northern Alabama. And then all of the Okies and Texans that moved to California <laughs> have the church strong over there because of migration of Christians who remain faithful. Interesting, over 2,000. So small in number, yes but it's God's remnant. We're special people, right? That which is rare is valuable, and we're valuable to God because we're His people. You should thank God every day for that. Thanks for the study here too. Thanks for your interest. Appreciate the encouragement to me. And then this final line, I think this is in your slides too, churches of Christ. I think it is good. Most of the churches are fairly small, and I think that's good because how can you be a family? You can, I guess, scripturally. I'm not going to say you can't have a scriptural large congregation, but it's easier to be a family, to know one another, to love one another if you're smaller. And I think that's reflected in, for the conservative churches. Uh, only, only about, what, 20% or over 100 out of 2,000? You know, about 20%, fairly large. What are we, about 50, you know, on Sunday? 60 to 99, 18%, 2 to 59, 60% of the congregation. Nice to know too, but another cause for us to be evangelistic, to grow. We want to grow. And we don't want to grow just to grow. We want to grow to why? Save souls, right? Preach the truth. Use our influence for good. And if we have a good knowledge, I think, of past events and know cycles and know what caused problems in the past, we can do better at preventing things from happening in the future in the Lord's church. And we want to be an influence for good. So, Ray, I thank you for your time. That, that's basically it. And uh, Keith, would you lead us in a word of prayer just uh, for protection on our way home and everything?